change, mass Order, extinction Senator and major Thorpe. waste. You'll be in prices. continuation when debate resumes. Questions without notice. Senator Chisholm. Oh, sorry, the mic. Senator, Senator Chisholm. <coughs> Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Under the Morrison government's current childcare scheme, a family with a full-time policeman and a physio working three days a week lose 91 cents in the dollar if the physio works the fourth and fifth day. Why is Mr Morrison refusing to support Labor's plan, which would see the same family more than $3,100 a, a year better off if they choose to work more hours? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr President, and, uh, and I thank the Senator for his question for the opportunity to highlight that our government, our side of politics, has taken childcare reform very seriously over recent years. Our reforms in terms of the application of the new childcare subsidy provided billions of dollars in additional support that was targeted, targeted to ensure that the more hours somebody works, the greater the number of hours of subsidised childcare they and their family are entitled to. And the less that they earn, the greater the rate of subsidy that they get. Now, it seems quite remarkable that the Labor Party seem to now be adopting a policy position that is all about providing higher rates of support in terms of the childcare subsidy to those earning higher levels of income. So, Mr. President, Mr. President, we absolutely want to make sure Order. that the childcare system works to support Australian families. And under our reforms, over 70 per cent of families have out-of-pocket costs of less than $5 an hour, and nearly a quarter are paying less than $2 an hour. Nearly a quarter are paying less than $2 per hour, and those families, Mr. President, would be the lowest income Australian families. So we have targeted childcare subsidy support to give the greatest level of assistance to Australian families working the longest hours but earning the lowest amount of income. Now the question of course always is when the Labor Party comes along and says we're going to bed in the budget a whole lot of extra structural spending Guess how they'll end up paying for it? Taxes? Higher taxes, no Order. doubt. Higher taxes. This will just be some little Labor trick where they pretend to give with one hand but take with the Order. other. Senator Birmingham. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Yes, Mr. President. Chloe from Chermside is a single mum who has been forced to say no to extra work because of the cost of childcare for her son. Why is the government blocking Queensland women like Chloe? from taking on extra work in a recession? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr President. And I again draw attention to the figures that I just went through that, uh, that would, dependent of course upon Chloe's circumstances and Chloe's income, uh, see very high rates of subsidy provided for the childcare fees that might be incurred. But I note that the Senator hasn't tried to give any of those sorts of details. He's constructed an example that doesn't actually allow anybody to compare whether it could be an 80 per cent or an 85 per cent rate of subsidy that is being paid. Indeed, in special circumstances, in special circumstances the government pays even more than that. I hear the senators ask, where's the calculator? Well, indeed, people can go onto the relevant social services websites Order. and they can ascertain how much support they are going to get. Yes, childcare comes at a cost, but we subsidise that cost and we give the greatest support to those earning the lowest incomes. Order. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Why has the Morrison government budgeted $15 million for Mr Morrison's ad campaign about Australia's comeback, but included nothing in this year's budget to make childcare more affordable? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, only the Labor Party could suggest that budgeting $9 billion for the childcare subsidy in 2020-21 was nothing. So we are budgeting $9 billion in expenditure to support childcare in this financial year alone. 
This is about $2 billion from memory, more than was being spent a couple of years ago prior to our reforms. So we came along as a government. We introduced reforms to create the childcare subsidy. We increased the rate of spending on childcare. That spending has now reached a point where, in this financial year, we will spend and invest $9 billion Order. to support the hardest working Australian families, to give the greatest support to those earning the least amount of money. And yet those opposite come in here and they pretend that $9 billion is nothing at all. Well, it's certainly order. not nothing Senator at all. Bur Senator Birmingham, I've got Senator Keneally on a point of order. Uh, my point of order is relevance. The minister is almost through with his answer, and we've yet to hear about the $15 million comeback order. advertising Senator campaign Keneally, that the question Senator asked Keneally, about. Senator it was a very open-ended question. The minister is being directly relevant. Senator Birmingham, you have five seconds remaining. Senator Chisholm asked, why are we giving nothing to childcare? On this side, we think $9 billion is actually quite a lot of money. Order. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister please update the Senate on the state of the labour market following COVID-19 and how the Morrison government has supported Australians through this once-in-a-century pandemic to stay connected to the labour force and to find employment? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Fawcett for his question. And Mr. President, uh, as you know, sorry again, I Senator think... Cash. Can you? We. Will, I thought we were going to have that looked at over the weekend. We've got the same microphone problem. You are blessed with a very loud voice, Senator Cash. But I'll ask you to lean into the next microphone, to, um, and we'll try and have that fixed overnight, Senator Cash. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm still just as loud. Um, COVID-19, as you know, has had an unprecedented impact uh, on the labour market. Uh, but new research that's been released by the National Skills Commission uh, on the Australian labour market shows that while the impact of COVID-19 has been unprecedented, there are signs of recovery and cause for optimism for all Australians. We have begun the long road to recovery. And in fact, we've seen 648,500 jobs return to the labour market since May. That is a good thing. Jobs are also returning in industries and occupations that have been impacted by COVID-19, but in particular the restrictions and the shutdowns. And what we're also seeing in regional Australia is job advertisements have been increasing by 17 0.6%. Mr President, in terms of the National Skills Commission and their report, it is critical to our understanding of the future of Australia's labour market. It shows where the new jobs will be created, but it also reinforces the Morrison government's work to make skills and vocational education uh, more flexible but also more relevant to actual labour market demand. In other words, we're actually training people to ensure that they have those skills to get into a job. Since the election, the coalition government, the Morrison government, we have focused uh, on improving Australia's vocational education and training system. And in fact, this year alone, we will now invest almost $7 billion in vocational education and training. We'll make the changes to this sector uh, to ensure that the training that Australians are undertaking is relevant and fit for purpose. And certainly, as we emerge from the economic impact of COVID-19, the government will utilise the National Skills Commission, which of course uh, we legislated, to further ensure that our skills sector is properly responding to actual labour market needs. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, what has the National Skills Commission's research shown about which jobs are likely to see continued growth as we emerge from the economic impacts of COVID-19? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And insights into future job opportunities are vital to support our economic recovery, but also to ensure that more Australians are able to get back into work as quickly as possible. And that's why, with the report that the National Skills Commission has released, it's highlighted the most resilient occupations 
in our labour market. This is good for people who are wondering what study or training they should undertake. Will they be entering one of those industries that has shown resilience despite COVID-19? And these occupations include, unsurprisingly, healthcare and social assistance, which have faced significant challenges as a result of COVID-19, uh, but also education and training as well as mining and construction and transport and warehousing. In terms of employment growth, it's expected to be in industries such as healthcare and social assistance, education and training, and professional scientific and technical services over the next five years. Uh, given the disruption caused by COVID-19 to the labour market, knowing that the Order. job you're training Senator for Cash, is going to be— time for the answer has expired. Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Minister, how will the research and work of the National Skills Commission ensure that the Job Trainer Fund is as targeted and focused as possible, ensuring that people receive training in the areas where there's actually demand for work? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr. President, as you'd be aware, uh, the Morrison government's $1 billion job trainer fund This is a crucial component uh, of our record investment into vocational education and training, and it's also an integral part of the government's job maker plan. The co-investment with the states and territories, all the states and territories uh, came on board. It's all about providing free or low-cost uh, training uh, to job seekers and young people, including school leavers. The key to the training, though, that we have worked individually with the states and territories to determine what their individual labour market demand is, and the job trainer courses, the free or low-cost training, they actually reflect what is in demand in the states and territories' labour markets themselves. Um, our goal as a government is to ensure that Australians receive qualifications in areas of skills demand. In other words, they are training for where the jobs are. You can visit yourcareer.gov.au for more information about job trainer. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. As early as January 2017, when Mr. Morrison was a Treasurer, the government was aware that up to 86 per cent of robo debts were incorrect and needed to be reassessed. When did Mr Morrison first become aware that almost nine out of ten robo-debts were wrong? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr President. Well, I would refer the Senate to Senator Rustin's answers on these questions. Yeah. Senator yeah. Kitching, a supplementary question. No, Order. Se Senator Kitching, on my left, Senator Kitching. Senator O'Neill, Senator Kitching is on her feet. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. Nathan, who was called by a robo-debt debt collector three times a day, said his mental health plummeted and that, and I quote, sometimes they'd call and I'd tell them like, I can't deal with this anymore, I've been thinking about taking my life, and things like that. It didn't change anything. Why did Mr Morrison continue to pursue vulnerable Australians like Nathan when he knew his robo-debt scheme was flawed and potentially invalid? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator, um, Senator for her question. The, uh, as Senator Rustin has made clear time and time again, uh, the government uh, is always willing to respond in confidence in relation to individual cases and to ensure that they are uh, treated appropriately and assessed and handled appropriately. When senators come in here with these sorts of questions, it's difficult to respond to the personal circumstances without the full details. However, in relation to all of these matters. The government has worked through them, has worked through the different, um, the different issues in relation to the debts that were raised Senator and has Watt provided— on a, on, so, Senator Watt, on a point of order? On, on relevance, Mr President, the question wasn't about Nathan's circumstances. The question was about why Mr Morrison continued to pursue the robo-debt program despite knowing of these problems. Okay, Senator, um, I make the point again. Ministers can be directly relevant by being directly relevant to an assertion contained in a question. And while I allowed you to restate the question, Senator Watt, there, I think it's a stretch to say Senator Birmingham wasn't being directly relevant by addressing the first part and then going on to addressing the second part d directly in the answer he was just giving. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Now, the government has worked through these issues and, in doing so, has provided uh, payments that uh, the Senate is well aware of uh, to address them. 
Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. David from Seaford was issued a robo debt variously calculated at $3,800, $4,088, $1,370, and $1,500 before being reduced to zero. David says, and I quote, I think I could have been one of the people who died because of this. They nearly cost me my life. When the government was told in a department brief on 1 March 2017 that a third of robo debts had been reassessed and reduced to zero dollars, why did Mr Morrison insist on putting the lives of thousands of people like David at risk? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr President, once again, uh, a number of these questions have been worked through, direct questions to Senator Rustin, questions through Senate estimates processes, uh, and indeed, indeed what, uh, what I know has occurred over a period of time is the opposition tends to take one Order. AAT finding or one issue that might have been handed down and conflate that uh, as something that provided conclusive proof in Order. relation to all matters of this program. Order. This program obviously had, had issues that have been dealt with and have resulted in repayments appropriately Senators being made Watt where necessary. And Senator Scar. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Will the minister update the Senate on the importance of Australia's relationship with Southeast Asia and the ways in which the government is strengthening our relationship with ASEAN countries? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Scar uh, for his question. Mr President, the government's strong view is that ASEAN is at the heart of Australia's vision for an open, inclusive and resilient Indo-Pacific region in which sovereign states are able to make independent choices. It's a vision which aligns closely with the principles set out in the ASEAN outlook for the Indo-Pacific. And we've continued to deepen our engagement with our Southeast Asian neighbours. Indeed, at the ASEAN Australia Summit uh, last month, the Prime Minister announced a major investment of over $500 million in economic development and security measures to support Southeast Asia's recovery from COVID-19. It's a package which aligns with ASEAN's priorities under the ASEAN outlook. Maritime, connectivity, sustainable development, economic cooperation. We welcome the agreement also to increase the tempo of our leaders' meetings to annual summits, because that opens up a new chapter in the ASEAN-Australia strategic partnership. We have also signed a strategic partnership with Thailand, facilitated the entry into force of the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement with Indonesia and agreed on a plan of action with Vietnam to deliver on our strategic partnership. Uh, I also met with Vietnam's ambassador uh, to Australia last week and took the opportunity to particularly thank Vietnam for their leadership of ASEAN during a very difficult year concerning the impact of COVID-19 uh, in particular. And also virtually last week with my Malaysian counterpart on Friday, Minister Hishmuddin Hussain, and thanked Malaysia for their role as our ASEAN country coordinator. Mr President, ASEAN is clearly more important than ever as we deal with the health and economic challenges that have been brought upon us by COVID-19. It is galvanising the region's response to the pandemic and particularly playing a central role in shaping how our region will emerge from the crisis. A strong ASEAN is critical to the recovery and the future prosperity of Australia and the Order. region. Senator That's Payne, why we stand together the in the challenges we face. Expired. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister advise how the government is continuing its strong engagement with South East Asian partners, our South East Asian family, during COVID-19? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And again, I thank Senator Scar. Uh, because there have been constraints imposed upon us by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, but we have, of course, continued our strong political engagement and dialogue with our partners in the region. As well as the Prime Minister's recent virtual attendance at the ASEAN Australia Summit this month uh, the, uh, and also the East Asia Summit, the government has signed the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement with 14 Indo-Pacific countries under the leadership of the Trade Minister, Minister Birmingham. I've met with all of my ASEAN counterparts together four times since June, including a special ASEAN Australia Foreign Ministers meeting on 30 June to discuss our shared COVID-19 response, as well, of course, as the annual East Asia Summit Foreign Ministers meeting and the ASEAN-related meetings, both in September. 
Uh, notwithstanding limited travel this year, I visited uh, uh, Singapore in October, affirming the strength of our relationship, and Brunei in February. Our continued engagement across government demonstrates our strong commitment Order. to this region. Senator Payne. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister outline the Mekong Australia program and the ways in which it will support this important region within Southeast Asia? Senator Payne. Thanks, Mr. President. We know that a prosperous and resilient Mekong is an important part of a strong Southeast Asia region, and that's why we'll invest in a new $232 million Mekong Australia program to support economic integration and development uh, in the Mekong subregion. That package announced by the Prime Minister includes investments for economic integration and development, high-quality infrastructure, support for our region's emerging security needs and for the development of maritime resources. The key elements Mr. President, include providing scholarships for emerging leaders, creating even more valuable people-to-people -people links, strengthening cybersecurity and critical technology capabilities, new funding to boost jobs and growth as part of the Vietnam-Australia Enhanced Economic Engagement Strategy, and opening a new liaison office in Naypyidaw in Myanmar in 2021. We're deeply committed to working with Mekong countries to manage the health and economic impacts of COVID-19 and to support economic integration and regional Order. development. Yeah. Senator Seawit. Mr. President, Mr. President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. The 2019-20 bushfires resulted in, a, in about 450 deaths due to direct in injury and air pollution exposure and sent thousands of people to hospital emergency departments with respiratory and heart problems. November was the hottest November on record. Leading health bodies, including the AMA, the Australian Nurses and Midwifery Federation, Australian College of Nursing and a majority of peak medical bodies have declared climate change a health emergency. Will the government declare the climate crisis a health emergency? Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I uh, thank Senator Seawitt for her question. And Senator Seawitt, uh, you would be aware uh, climate change is a global challenge for all countries, uh, including Australia, and all of us need to take action to mitigate and adapt to its impacts. Uh, as part of the Australian government's response, uh, the Australian government is focused on developing a sustainable and responsive health system. You have asked the Minister for Health the question, uh, with a range of programs which can be expanded or operationalised to respond to emerging pressures, including those that are climate-related. Indeed, the Australian government released its National Climate Resilience and Adaptation Strategy in 2015. And I'm sure you are aware, Senator Seawood, that the strategy recognises that in Australia, national and subnational governments, businesses, households and communities all have different but important roles in managing climate risks, including those that impact on health and wellbeing. The National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework, which, as you know, was released in April of 2019, provides the big picture for the work that government, industries, business, not-for-profits, communities and individuals in Australia must do together so that we can live successfully with these hazards and the hazards that you have referred to uh, in your question to me for decades to come. In terms of the practical steps that the government is taking, uh, we are working with the states and territories to ensure that Australia's capacity to respond to the health impacts of climate change are appropriate and effective. And they include the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee, which has, as you are aware, identified climate change as a health protection priority. Uh, the committee has in fact asked its National Health Emergency Standing Committee, committee to develop a national heat health framework. Senator C, what a supplementary question. Thank you. The World Health Organisation calls the climate crisis one of the greatest th threats to our health. The Grattan Institute and the MJA Lancet Countdown have called it the greatest health risk facing future generations. Why doesn't Australia's long-term national health plan address the climate crisis? Senator Cash. Uh, well, again, Senator Seward, I believe I've just taken you through some of the steps that the government is undertaking uh, in response to the issues 
that you have raised. As I've stated, the government in uh, 2015 released its National Climate Resilience and Adaptation Strategy. Uh, in April 2019, the government released uh, the National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework. Uh, in addition to that, as I've said, the government is working with the states and territories uh, in particular to ensure that Australia's capacity to respond to the health impacts of climate change are appropriate and effective. Uh, what I was unable to say to you uh, in answer to your primary question was that the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee uh, has also tasked the Environmental Health Standing Committee uh, with reviewing the science on the health effects of prolonged smoke exposure. You raised smoke exposure uh, in your primary question. Uh, and in fact, they published a statement on the 7th of August 2020. Uh, the government is also taking action in direct response to Order. the health impacts Cash, of the 1920 the bushfire crisis. Senator C, what a final supplementary question. Thank you. Leading health researchers and health bodies are urging an accelerated response to reducing emissions and preparing health systems. Does the government agree that the net zero emissions should be achieved by 2035 and that it's essential if we are to protect the health of future generations? Good question. Senator Cash. Uh, well, Senator Seward, I refer you to the incredibly eloquent answers uh, that the Leader of the Government in the Senate gives every time a question on this is raised. Uh, the Government is committed uh, to achieving this as soon as possible, and that is why we have put in place uh, the practical actions that we are taking to ensure that we respond to climate change, which, as I've said, is a global challenge uh, for all countries, including Australia. Senator so Seward, the difference between those of us on the government side of the chamber uh, and, unfortunately, those in the Australian Greens is that we are putting in place practical actions to ensure that we tackle climate change. You, for some reason, just don't seem to like the practical actions that we are putting in place. And yet, to date, the practical actions that we have put in place are being successful. Senator Billick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. The Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with a Disabilities report into COVID-19 found that the Morrison government was responsible for significant failings from the onset of the pandemic. The Royal Commission heard evidence that a disabled woman was bedridden for nine days, surviving only on muesli bars with no help for meals or care. How many Australians living with disability were left behind by the Morrison government and forced to survive without meals or care? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Billick for her question um, on what is a very important issue, and that is the respect yeah. with which yeah. uh, we treat all Australians, but particularly those that live with disability. And for that reason, the government welcomed the interim report from the Disability Royal Commission. Um, because we believe that everybody, absolutely everybody, but most particularly the government, um, has an absolute huge role to play in stamping out violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability. Um, and so we thank the Royal Commission for the work it does. Um, we set up the Royal Commission because we wanted to shine a spotlight on what was going on to make sure that um, some of the, the actions of the past didn't happen into the future. But, um, I would also acknowledge in this chamber, and hope everybody else would acknowledge in this chamber, that um, this year we saw a once-in-a-century pandemic hit our country, um, and we acted as, as quickly as we could um, with every resource that was available to government to be able to support all Australians to make sure that, in the first instance, we uh, put in place the protections, the health protections that they needed. Um, look, we acknowledge that the the pandemic was traumatic for for all Australians, but it must have been, and I'm sure it clearly was, um, particularly traumatic for those people who live with disability, Senator yeah. to Steele John, yeah. um, and, and I absolutely acknowledge that. But I just want to make sure that I take this opportunity to assure um, all Australians, but particularly Australians who live with disability or who um, look after and care for people with disability, that um, this government absolutely has them foremost in their mind, in front of mind. And, um, I mean, I'm happy to go through a, a, the list of consultations that I've had with the disability sector over the last nine months, and I, I thank the amazing uh, work of, uh, of those, uh, particularly the disability advocates, which has been an extraordinarily hard time yeah. for them. And I, 
absolutely congratulate them for the engagement they've had with the government to make sure Order, that we Senator look after Rustin, people with time disabilities. For the expired. Senator Billick, a supplementary question. Thank you. The Royal Commission also heard evidence that another woman who went for four days without a support worker amid fears she and her husband had been exposed to COVID-19 said, and I quote, I just couldn't get PPE anywhere. I saw Scott Morrison saying PPE was being provided and I was like, hello, where's mine? There was none. How many Australians living with a disability were left behind by the Morrison government when it failed to provide them with the PPE they needed to stay safe? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, certainly um, one of the things that was absolutely a priority was to make sure that we moved with great speed so that nobody got left behind and nobody was forgotten during this pandemic. But we quickly forget on the other side about how extraordinary the circumstances were that we found ourselves in in March this year. Um, and can I also acknowledge the, the respectful and collaborative way that those at the other end of the chamber sought to work with me to provide me with information so that I knew what was going on in the sector. They didn't seek to come in here and publicise it. And I acknowledge um, Senator Steele John particularly, um, who picked up the phone regularly to raise issues with me of great concern to him, and we did our best to make sure that we resolved those. But I'd also point out, just as a matter of some interest, that the Royal Commission did Order. not speak to probably what I consider the two most senior public Order. servants. They did not speak to the Deputy Secretary of Disability Order. or the CEO of the NDIA to get more information Order, about the Senator issues. Order, Senator Rustin. The noise levels getting a little bit loud. Colleagues, Senator Billick, final Thank you. And if question. that's your best work, I'm a bit worried. Under the Morrison government, vulnerable Australians, from those in residential aged care to those living with disabilities, have been left neglected and abandoned by Mr Morrison. Why is Mr Morrison leaving Australians living with a disability behind and failing to keep them safe? Senator Rustin. Well, I would completely reject the premise of, uh, of the question that has just been asked of me, because I can assure you that the Morrison government has worked tirelessly to make sure that no Australian would be left behind. But as we recognise the situation that we all found ourselves in this year, uh, it was a it was a once in a century once pandemic. A century. However, I mean I can tell you what I did as the minister who has broader responsibility for disability, as opposed to the NDIS, um, that I worked with the uh, the disability sector. Um, I had numerous meetings, and I, I'd like to shout out Ben Gortland, who's our disability discrimination commissioner, for the extraordinary hard work that they did, along with the advocacy groups, to make sure that the voices of people with disability were heard during this time so that we could respond to the specific needs, because um, clearly every Australian um, was faced with a situation that they had never seen before, and um, we worked very, very well with the disability sector, and I acknowledge the huge amount of support they Order, gave me. Senator Rustin. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. My question is addressed to Senator Rustin, representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia. The Australian government used the weakest gas laws in the world to attract foreign oil and gas companies to exploit Australia's offshore deposits of natural gas. The government now receives approximately $200 million a year for the offshore natural gas taken from the northwest shelf, which drives tens of billions of dollars of exports, including to China, where we supply 10 per cent of their total energy requirements. Failure to get a fair payment for our offshore gas represents a gift of billions of dollars a year to foreign oil and gas companies, money better spent on Australians. What has stopped the government implementing the single recommendation of the 2017 Callaghan report so Australia can be fairly paid for its offshore gas? The Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Hanson for her question. And at the outset, can I acknowledge um, you know, your long-standing and passionate commitment to ensuring that Australians are the beneficiary of our nation's endowment of natural resources. Um, and the government has worked very hard to strengthen the integrity of the petroleum resource and rent tax by addressing the design issues that were contained within the Callaghan um, re re Independent Review. In fact, uh, the government brought down its response to the Callaghan Review on 2 November uh, 2018, uh, and in that um, we then worked to make sure that we implemented the, uh, you know, many of the recommendations that were contained in that review. 
um, you know, things like uh, reducing the uplift rates that apply to carried forward expenditure. Uh, we've also set up a process to uh, address the remaining recommendations relating to the gas transfer pricing uh, for LNG projects. Uh, indeed, legislation giving effect to the key changes came into force on 1 July 2019 and will raise an additional $6 billion over the next decade. We are absolutely committed to supporting the resource sector, which has indeed invested over $600 billion in Australian projects over the last decade. Um, but in doing so, we need to make sure that we strike the balance between uh, making sure that, that investors around the world know that Australia's doors are open for investment, but at the same time making sure that the national interest uh, is being realised by making sure Australians are the beneficiary of our resources. So, Foreign direct investment has been an absolutely enduring feature of our national story, um, and oil and gas industry is one of those industries that has been absolutely at the forefront um, of making sure that we are able to prosper as a nation by realising the value of the resources that we have in the ground, whether it be under our depressial soils or under the sea. Uh, and we will make sure that the national interest is always served. Order. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Minister, I, I understand it's not your portfolio, but that response is, I'm sorry, it's, uh, it's not a response at all. The government advised Papua New Guinea on its gas laws. They got a better deal from the same gas giant operating on the northwest shelf. If we can, if we can help PNG negotiate fair payment for natural gas, gas, why can't we do it ourselves? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I would thank Senator Hanson for, for her follow-up question. Um, well, I believe that the Australian government, through a number of regimes, has always sought to make sure that Australians are the beneficiaries of the resources that belong to all Australians, um, and that's why um, you know, we made sure that, with the, resource, uh, the petroleum resource rent tax uh, that was brought in by those opposite um, back in 1987, uh, to make sure that we put in place a regime. Um, around Australia to make sure that these projects were um, providing benefit to Australians, which most importantly included um, increasing the taxation revenue that, the Australia, that Australia was able to achieve it. I mean, in, uh, as an example, the most recent data available from the Australian Tax Office uh, says that the resources sector paid approximately $11.4 billion in company tax in 2017-18. I'm advised that in 2018, uh, Woodside alone uh, uh, paid 50, 555 million in Australian corporate income tax. Order, and Senator Rustin. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. Thank you very much. Um, it's estimated that we actually uh, export about 55 billion dollars worth of gas. We actually have um, Chevron, Exxon Mobil, and um, Shell actually only have about $360 billion in tax credits. We're not going to get tax out of them. So, and the Reserve Bank says Australians need to buy shares in foreign gas companies or work for them to get any benefit for Australian-owned offshore gas. When will the government act Order, in the best Senator interest Hanson. of Australians and Senator change Rustin. laws? Um, thank you very much, Mr President. Um, well, uh, Senator Hanson, I'm actually not aware of the specific piece of advice you refer to um, from the Reserve Bank, um, but one thing I can advise the Chamber is that resource companies operating in Australia um, in our mineral and petroleum industries are subject to corporate income tax. And as I said, in 2017-18 alone, $11.4 billion came into the Australian government coffers uh, as a result of the taxation that was paid um, by the mineral and petroleum industries. Um, royalty revenues also are received by state and territory governments uh, for onshore mineral and petroleum production. And my understanding is that in the years 18-19, approximately $14 billion was realised by state and territory governments um, in royalty revenues from these types of projects. So, um, Maintaining a stable investment environment, um, including through our taxation system, is absolutely vital in ensuring we can continue to prosecute our resources for the benefit Order. of all Australians. Senator Rustin. Yeah. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence. Can the Minister update the Senate on what support Defence has provided to international partners across the Indo-Pacific during COVID-19? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I also thank Senator Betts for that question. And I also thank you for your enduring support for our men and women in uniform and also for defence. Building a stronger Australia post-pandemic rests on a secure and stable Indo-Pacific. That's why defence is supporting not only our own national recovery from COVID-19, but also the recovery of our regional friends and partners. We have already reorientated funding through the government's defence cooperation programs to assist our regional partners deal with COVID-19. This is in addition to the significant support that the ADF have provided on Operation COVID-19 Assist. Now, over 10,000 ADF members have been contributing to state and territory responses since uh, the beginning of this year. But in the South Pacific, our support has focused on very targeted country-specific priorities. This includes planning, health, logistics, vehicle and asset maintenance, the delivery of personal PPE and also supplies. In Southeast Asia, Australia has supported regional defence forces to respond to the pandemic. A couple of examples include a $2 million package of personal protective equipment to Indonesia's armed forces to support their assistance and their ability to deal with their own nation's COVID-19 response. A secondly, a second example is a total of $3 million of assistance to the armed forces of the Philippines to enable their ongoing support to infectious disease, disease wards across the country and support their own armed forces personnel. And in the Indian Ocean region, we provided personal protective equipment for the defence forces of Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and also the Maldives. Defence stands firmly with its regional partners during these most challenging of times for us all. Senator Pett, a supplementary question. Uh, yes, Mr President. I thank the minister for that answer and ask the following. Can the minister update the Senate on the continuation of defence regional operations and activities during COVID-19? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Again, thank you very much, Mr President, and Senator Abetz for the question. Uh, throughout COVID-19, one of the proudest things that our nation has seen is the fact that the ADF have not missed a beat. Yes, we've had to adapt work practices, but we have not missed a beat throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. And during that time, Australia has continued to strengthen its military-to-military -military engagement with our partners. Partners who share our vision for a stable, prosperous and rules-based Indo-Pacific. This is despite the many challenges facing us all with COVID-19. For example, our regional presence deployment, which ran from July to September, was the largest ever ADF deployment to the Indo-Pacific, and we exercised with 11 nations in total. Navy has also conducted seven separate maritime activities with Japan alone this year. Australia participated in the maritime exercise Malabar last month with our close partners India, Japan and the United States, and those exercises continue. Senator Keneally. Oh, sorry, Senator Abetz. Final supplementary question. I've miscounted. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister update the Senate on how defence is maintaining close engagement with Australia's Pacific family during COVID-19? Senator Abetz. Sorry, Senator. I'm having a bad run today. <laughs> Senator Reynolds. I can't answer my own question. <laughs> Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I'm sure Senator Abetz is very capable of answering his own questions. Uh, but in all seriousness. Defence is continuing to support our Pacific family to address the health and economic challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. Work continues apace with Papua New Guinea, Fiji and Vanuatu on significant defence infrastructure projects in those nations, projects that enhance security and also provide much-needed economic stimulus and local employment opportunities in those nations. These projects, those projects in those three countries alone are expected to create over 350 jobs in Papua New Guinea, 555 jobs in Fiji and 178 jobs in Vanuatu, with many more to come. Defence continues to deliver New Guardian-class patrol boats throughout COVID-19, eight to date to regional partners under the Pacific Maritime Security Program. And in fact, Tonga received its second Guardian-class patrol boat during a COVID-safe handover at Henderson in October. This Order. program Senator fundamentally Reynolds, supports the regional has sovereignty. Expired. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, Minister Payne. Laura, who is stranded in Spain and wants to come home, has had her status changed by DFAT to, quote, not seeking to return to Australia. 
despite making it clear to a caller from DFAT that she was trying to return as soon as possible and had flights booked in coming weeks. She has said, and I quote, I can't shake the feeling the reclassifications on the DFAT portal are a cynical drive to deliver the government a Christmas miracle. Why isn't the Prime Minister setting up a national quarantine facility at Learmonth or other locations so stranded Australians can get home before Christmas, as he promised, instead of cooking the books to make it look like they don't want to be home by Christmas? The Minister of Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, thanks, Senator Kinley, for her question. And absolutely reject any suggestion that members of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade or any other public servants who are engaged in the consultation with Australians about their current status are cooking the books, to use her pejorative term, Mr. President. Order. Let me be very clear: DFAT will Order not remove any right. Australians from its registration database without their consent. I am not familiar with the specific example to which Senator Keely, Keneally has referred, but I will undertake to uh, take details from her uh, after question time and follow that up. What we have done, Mr President, is to work with Services Australia to contact registered Australians to ensure that the information we have in our database is up to date and correct. Having detailed information assists us with planning for facilitated commercial flights. That includes the Qantas flight, Mr. President, that arrived in Hobart yesterday from New Delhi. It also helps us to prioritise vulnerable Australians within the caps on incoming passenger arrivals. I don't know how those opposites suggest that we actually manage this process without having the most current information, Mr. President, without having up-to-date data from Australians. We are in the middle of a global pandemic, Mr. President, and people's circumstances do and are changing very quickly. Within the registration database, there are different status fields related to Australians' intentions to return. We will only change their status on their behalf based on information that has been provided to the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And as I said, we will not remove Australians from our registration database without their consent. Mr President, this is a very intensive process to try to support as many Australians as we can. Since the 18th of September, over 43,800 Australians have returned from overseas. That includes more than 17,000 Australians Order. registered Senator with DFAT. Payne, of which time for the answer has expired. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. It has been 80 days since the Prime Minister promised the 26,000 stranded Australians on DFAT's list that they would be home by Christmas. Only 17,000 on that list have come home. Given the Prime Minister only has three days to deliver on his promise and bring the remaining stranded Australians on DFAT's list as of the 18th of September home by Christmas, how many of those stranded Australians will not make it home by Christmas? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, as Senator Keneally has observed, and as I said in my previous answer, over 43,800 Australians have returned from overseas, which includes more than 17,000 Australians registered with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And of those, over 3,700 were vulnerable, Mr. President. We have been seeking information from those Australians uh, to ensure that we are able to assist them with the most up-to-date and timely information. Since the 23rd of October, we have facilitated 13 commercial flights, returning 1,847 passengers. In the last four weeks alone, Mr. President, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has made over 30,000 offers of places on flights to Australians registered overseas. This is a very complex process process to assist Australians who are in very difficult circumstances in many cases. I absolutely acknowledge that, Mr President. But since the 18th of September, at least 43,000 Australians Order. have been Senator able to Payne, return from time overseas. For the expired. Senator Keneally, final supplementary question. Why is it that Mr Morrison prioritises flying his mate, former Finance Minister Matthias Cormann, around Europe to the tune of $4,300 an hour? while tens of thousands of Australians are left behind overseas by his government. Senator Payne. 
Mr. President, as I understand it, and we are grateful for that support, those opposite support the very important campaign to seek the election of Matthias Cormann to lead the OECD at a time, Mr. President, when the world needs strong leadership such as that that Mr. Cormann would deliver. The OECD has never been led by anybody from our region, Mr. President, but it does beg beggar the imagination, Mr. President, than those opposite would seek to conflate their cheap political point with the important process of getting Australians back to Order. Australia. And I would suggest, Mr President, that the effort that the consular officers of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, that the effort of officials are making to return Australians literally in, in every capital where Australians are located and to support them is a very, very focused and conscientious one, Mr President. But we are operating in the middle of a pandemic, Mr President. We are operating with quarantine caps, we are operating with flight restrictions, and we Order, have returned Senator over 43,800 for Australians has expired. since the Order on my left and my right. Senator Dean Smith. Much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Could the Minister advise the Senate how the Morrison government's health response to COVID-19 is helping to underpin our economic recovery? And secure Australia's future. The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Smith for his question. Mr. President, uh, we know that around the world, globally, COVID-19 uh, is continuing to spread. Globally, we have now reached 66.4 million COVID-19 cases, and sadly, uh, we have lost 1.5 million lives. Uh, we see that outside of Australia. The challenge of COVID-19 is significant and it is tragic. Uh, but when we look at the situation here in Australia, compared with other developed nations, uh, we are in Australia in a very good position. In the United States, for example, the death rate is 23.9 times what we have seen in Australia. In the United Kingdom, the death rate is over 25 times what we have seen in Australia. Uh, so our success in managing the health crisis uh, as a country and as a government has built the foundation for our economic recovery. Uh, we've had real challenges and genuine loss, but in terms of the outcome that we are currently seeing in Australia, it is certainly one uh, which other parts of the world envy. In Australia, we have now had 27,965 confirmed cases of COVID-19. Uh, and sadly, 908 deaths. Uh, as of 4 p.m. yesterday, we have had zero cases of community transmission in the past 24 hours, and certainly uh, that is a good thing. In terms of our response uh, to COVID-19, more than $18.5 billion has been committed to support the emergency COVID-19 health response. Uh, as a government, as you know, we took early action to close the borders and institute quarantine arrangements. We've established 147 GP uh, respiratory clinics, and we've now conducted more than 10.1 million tests in Australia since the pandemic commenced. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister explain how the testing capacity of Australia supported this health outcome, which is enabling our economic comeback? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Senator Smith. And certainly, uh, in terms of the testing, as I've said, Australia has now conducted over 10.1 million COVID-19 tests. Uh, this has indeed been a critical uh, component of our health success and our ability to track, trace, and, as we've seen by the statistics uh, that I've referred the Senate to, contain the COVID-19 virus. Uh, in terms of the work that our health agencies uh, have undertaken to build testing capacity, it is quite remarkable, uh, and certainly we congratulate them. When you consider that in January of this year, there was no such thing as a COVID-19 test. So when you look at the work of our health agencies, the fact that Australia has now conducted in excess of 10.1 million tests. Uh, they, certainly, they certainly deserve our thanks. Uh, Mr President, we've also taken a number of steps to ensure that we could build this capacity, including putting in place Medicare funding for COVID-19 tests and sourcing the materials Order, needed Cash, to keep our testing supplies. Expired. Senator Smith, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How will the Morrison government's approach 
to securing and rolling out a COVID-19 vaccine ensure that Australians are safe and position our economy for recovery from a COVID-19 recession? Senator Cash. Um, well, Mr. President, when you look at the situation in Australia today, and certainly compared to uh, the rest of the world, um, it enables us to take precautions when it comes to rolling out the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, while there are rapid rollouts, and we've certainly seen them um, announced last week around the world, uh, the situation here in Australia uh, is quite different. In fact, it's quite unique. Locally, the Therapeutic Goods Administration has given a priority assessment to three different vaccines. The TGA is currently assessing all of the available medical evidence of these vaccines to verify that they are indeed uh, safe for use in Australia. The safety of the vaccine program is, of course, our top priority as a government. Uh, we've made a deliberate decision to diversify uh, our vaccine portfolio with a range of vaccines and all of the different data. Uh, the rollout of the Pfizer vaccine in the United Kingdom uh, will provide us with additional information to assess the safety of the rollout of the vaccine in Order. Australia. Senator Cash. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr President. My question this afternoon is to the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. A report out today from the Brotherhood of St Lawrence states that youth employment was, and I quote, already, already stubbornly high before COVID. Can the minister confirm the report's finding that one in three young Australians are unable to find any work or don't have enough hours of work to make ends meet? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, uh, and thanks, Senator, for the question. Uh, and as I said in the chamber here last week, the youth unemployment rate at 15.6 per cent is too high. Uh, that's why this government has invested so much, which we have been criticised for by the opposition, uh, in measures to support younger Australians to get back to work, Mr President. Uh, in fact, in, in some of those measures, Mr President, the opposition has actually voted against those measures in this place, Mr President. Uh, and, and so, Mr. President, we recognised that the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic was going to be significant on younger Australians, Mr. President. And so that's why, as we've worked our way through the COVID pandemic, and in the budget that we released just a few weeks ago, we had such a significant effort that was focused towards getting younger Australians back to work, Mr. President. Mr. President, we invested four billion dollars, Mr. President in the job maker hiring credit, Mr President. Mr President, we invested a um, significant amount of money to provide a 50 per cent wage subsidy for apprentices who were starting a new apprenticeship, new apprentices in businesses, or recommencing. Mr President, we want to keep younger Australians connected with their employers uh, and we want to provide incentives for employers to employ younger Australians because we know the longer term effects of unemployment for younger Australians have a significant impact on their financial capacity over a period of time. Mr. Well, Mr. President, I'll take the interjection. And that's exactly how I started my answer. The unemployment rate at 15.6 per cent is too high. I have acknowledged that, Mr. President. We've just been through, we've got, just been through an, uh, a pandemic, Mr. President, a global pandemic, which is having a disproportionate impact on younger Australians, Mr President, and so that's why this government has invested so heavily in measures to assist Order, younger Australians Senator Colbeck, to get Senator Pratt, a supplementary question. How many young Australians could have been spared from the unemployment queues if the Morrison government had not excluded so many of them from JobKeeper? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, the measures that we've put in place to assist younger Australians back into work are just not about one single measure. We have invested in a number of measures to assist employers to take on younger Australians. We were criticised for focusing too much on younger Australians in our budget only a few weeks ago, Mr. President, by those on the other side, Mr. President. They forget what they were saying Order. just a few weeks ago, Mr. President, when they were criticising our budget for being so heavily focused on younger Australians and assisting younger Australians to get back into work and all of the programs that we put into place, Mr. President. We make no apology for focusing on younger Australians to get back to work. 
We recognise, as I said just a moment ago, Mr. President, that the impact on younger Australians who, who don't have work when they're young uh, is over a longer period of time and more significant. And we're doing, we will do everything that we can to assist the employers to get younger people Order, back into Senator work. Senator Colbeck, Senator Pratt, a final supplementary question. How many young Australians are underemployed, and when does the government predict that the number will drop back to pre-pandemic levels? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, as the many measures that we've put in place to support younger Australians to get back into work, the, the unemployment rate will continue to, to improve. In fact, in some states it has improved over the, the recent period of announcement, Mr President. So in my home state of Tasmania, for example, uh, the, the youth unemployment rate actually order. reduced Senator over Keneally, the last report. On point of order. Uh, point of order is relevant. The question the minister is providing an answer about unemployment. The question was actually about underemployment. It asked specifically how many young Australians are underemployed. I ask you to uh, direct the minister to be relevant to the question. This was um, I, this is where the test order. This is this is this is where the test of direct relevance, in my view, needs to be much more strictly applied than the test of relevance. It was a specific question that asked for a number without any what I'd call loaded or pejorative phrases. So to be directly relevant, in my view, the minister needs to address the issue of what was raised in the question uh, because it was specific and um, factual in nature. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. And as I, was, as I said, the measures that we put in place in the budget are designed to increase employment in younger Australians, okay. to get younger Australians back to work and to encourage employers, specifically, specifically encourage employers to employ younger Australians. And we will continue to focus in that area because we understand what an important order. part of the economy is. Senator Colbeck. Of Senator Keneally on a point of order. Thank you, and I acknowledge your ruling. And I realise the minister only has 14 seconds left, so we would appreciate if he could answer the question: How many young Australians are underemployed? Um, on this particular issue, Senator Colbeck, I, I am going to ask that you either come to the question um, that was factual in nature, uh, because there has been a period of time to comment more broadly. Um, and there was no political content to the question. Senator Colbeck, or have you concluded your answer? No. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. As I've said a number of times today, the number of people who are unemployed, and I'll add to that the number of young people who are underemployed, is too large. That is why we're investing so Order. significantly, Order. Mr. President. Order. Senator Colbeck. Senator Keneally. Thank you. Uh, I acknowledge your previous rulings about the relationship between unemployment and underemployment, but the minister is again talking about unemployment. This question is, as you have pointed out, quite specific. How many young Australians are underemployed? We asked the minister in the last five seconds to answer the question. I'm uh, order. The minister did mention. I'll answer the point of order when there's silence. It's only Monday, everyone. Uh, now, on the point of order, Senator Keneally, the minister did mention underemployment then, as you got to your feet. I did hear him talk about both. However, I have not had to ask a minister to stop answering a question, but when I have a specific question that says how many are and when will it return, that is factual in nature without any political loading or phrasing in the question. That requires an answer to be directly relevant. A directly relevant answer is not a broad commentary on the topic. So I'm going to remind ministers of that because I've always said if questions are specific in nature without political phrasing, then directly relevant is a very strict test. Where questions actually include arguable phrases and loaded terminology, ministers are allowed to respond in kind. But this was a very specific question about how many and when shall it return without loading, and I'm happy to be corrected if the Hansard shows me otherwise. So I ask the minister to be very specific. Ministers always have the ability to take it on notice. And we have five seconds remaining. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and the rate will return to previous levels as the measures that we have put order. in place well, come to pass. Firstly, I'm going to take the point of order, but Senator Keneally. 
He was talking about the timing of, the rate of, of when the rate would return. That was directly relevant. That was actually the phrasing of the second part of the question. Dude, I, I cannot be instruct the minister how to answer a question. Senator Keneally? Thank you, Mr. President. And noting your previous ruling and your comments and your advice to the minister that he take it on notice. That wasn't my advice. I said ministers have the your option, Senator Keneally. Your observation that the minister could take it on notice, given that the minister has not advised the House or the Chamber this is, of the Senator number. Senator Keneally, this isn't a point of order. This is not a point of order, Senator Keneally. I would ask Senator Keneally, this is not a point of order. There's a time after question time. The minister was being directly relevant after my final ruling there, talking about timing. The clock time ran out. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Will I ask, and indeed particularly invite the question of the opposition if they wish, to place further questions on notice? motions to take note of answers. Senator McAllister. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Birmingham to the question asked by Senator Chisholm. It's hard to imagine what would actually provoke this government to meaningfully respond to women's economic interests, and in particular the significance and importance of Australian women having access to the labour market and consequently developing their own economic and financial independence. Because the true meaning of independence is the ability to find your way out of circumstances not of your choosing, to make real choices in the knowledge that you have the economic resources to support you, and the indifference to women's labour market participation, the indifference to their economic interests, the indifference to their wealth, the indifference to their super, is absolutely remarkable. This question on this occasion was about childcare, and for many families the cost of childcare is far too high. Childcare fees in Australia are amongst the highest in the OECD. And in fact, our costs as a proportion of income are only eclipsed by a handful of other countries. And it comes at a cost and it shows in our statistics because high childcare fees are not only a hit to household budgets, but they act as a very, very significant barrier for parents, especially women, to return to work. And the issue is that the childcare subsidy interacts with the personal tax system and the family tax benefit to mean that many mothers, many mothers actually pay, actually pay if they take on additional hours, and many, many more lose most of the additional income that they would obtain through working those hours. Women are being forced to, withdraw, to reduce their working hours, missing out on career opportunities and advancement, missing out on superannuation, missing out on income. Women need to balance earning enough money to afford these very high childcare fees, but not so much that the childcare subsidy plummets and makes the experience of work financially pointless. And the impact of this was shared by one young mother recently who said, realising it made more financial sense to work four days rather than five felt like an absolute blow. At no point did we consider my husband dropping down for four days. He was in a secure job and his employer would not consider this. I, on the other hand, being a mum returning from leave, is nearly expected to be the one to request part-time employment. And that young mum isn't alone, because her story is borne out again and again and again in the data. So data from the ABS shows that of parents with a child younger than five, only 64 per cent of women were in the workforce compared with 95 per cent of men. And of those mothers who do work, 60 per cent of those are working part-time compared to only 7 per cent of fathers. Even when children go to school, women continue to work part-time and women are much more likely to be underemployed than men. And one of the structural reasons for this low workforce participation amongst women is because of the high out-of-pocket costs of childcare and the punitive tax rate that secondary income earners face. We are facing very difficult economic circumstances. This is a time when governments all over the world 
are searching for solutions for growth, searching for solutions for productivity. If you want to increase Australia's productive capacity, it is pretty straightforward. There is an army of women out there waiting for opportunities to work, but on the condition that they actually are meaningfully financially rewarded for that contribution. And you would think that it would be a policy priority for this government to consider their interests, because it would be fair. It would be significantly fairer for those women, but it would be a good thing for the economy. It's a flat-out no-brainer. It is the most straightforward thing you could do to lift Australia's productive capacity. But there is zero interest, because this is a government run by men with almost no interest in the interest of women, who treat women's issues with contempt when they are raised here in this chamber, at the estimates table, in the media. We get glib responses. Well, women are Australians. We look after all Australians. Well, I can tell you that that is not what the data shows. The data shows women's economic interests are not improving. Women still face a gender pay gap. They face a super gap. They face a wealth gap. They face increasing rates of homelessness. And under this government, they face one of the highest rates of childcare costs in the OECD. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Seselja. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Uh, and I wanted to start by responding to the uh, last part of Senator McAllister's contribution, uh, where, uh, in, in, in attacking the coalition, uh, she ignores the record rates of female participa workforce participation uh, in this nation under a coalition government. Uh, she ignores those inconvenient facts for herself. She talks about you know, there being no women in the government when we have the highest number of women in a cabinet uh, in the history of our Commonwealth uh, under this coalition government. So those criticisms should be seen for what they are because they are not backed up by the facts. This government uh, will always uh, prioritise uh, participation uh, in the workforce of women, uh, allowing families uh, to make choices. Uh, that has been our government's record. Uh, that's what we'll continue to do, and that's what our policies are directed uh, at. And, but you do have to take a, take a step back before I go into some of the stats, uh, read childcare and the support that the coalition and the Morrison government uh, has been giving to childcare and to families uh, accessing childcare over a number of years. You do have to ask the question when you, when you hear from the Labor Party um, and their critique on childcare, who does the Labor Party represent? Who does the modern Labor Party represent? Because what they are arguing against is uh, a childcare policy which has absolutely prioritised those on low and middle incomes. Uh, this is the government. Uh, that actually said we are going to give a higher rate of subsidy, a higher rate of subsidy to those on low and middle incomes, uh, and yet we have a Labor Party <coughs> who claims to represent workers uh, who would say no. What you actually have to do is you have to give more subsidies to those on very high incomes. That is the Labor Party's policy, and that is the Labor Party's critique when it comes to childcare. And so when. I hear and when, when we hear this line of questioning and this line of attack from the Labor Party, I am reminded uh, of the comments of Joel Fitzgibbon when he says he wants to put Labor uh, back into the Labor Party. Because, you know, it is extraordinary. I wouldn't have thought, I mean, I'm old enough to remember when people didn't have to say things like, let's put Labor back into the Labor Party, because perhaps many years ago, perhaps when I was just, a, just but a young man, uh, a very young man, Labor may have had a reputation as actually supporting workers, uh, and perhaps a reputation once upon a time, once perhaps in the distant past, as actually supporting low and middle income workers. Uh, but what we have is a modern Labor Party who has forgotten about those roots, who has forgotten about those noble roots, dare I say it, of a once great Labor Party who used to represent those kind of workers and now need to be you reminded. Never, you never did. Oh, I never did. Yeah, I'll compare. I'll compare backgrounds with you. When you were campaigning for the legalisation of dope at university, I was working as a cleaner, mate. So I'm not going to take I'm not going to take interjections from Senator Murray White. You know, we understand what it's like 
to, to earn a living. And the modern Labor Party, and that, that interjection again, yeah, I've worked as a cleaner. I've done, the, I've done the hard jobs, mate. I don't know what, apart from agitating for drug law reform, mate, with your mates at university, I'm not really sure uh, what, your, what your cred is on this. But the modern Labor Party, the modern Labor Party, I'll tell you, doesn't have a lot of cred. And when it comes to childcare, they are now putting to the Australian people and to the government that instead of, in fact, prioritising prioritising low and middle income earners as we are doing, uh, that what we should be doing is giving higher rates of subsidy to higher income earners. This is a government that has a proud record, a proud record of delivering for families, a proud record of keeping childcare rates as low as they possibly can, as opposed to the Labor Party's policy, which saw the, the costs of childcare, the out-of-pocket costs, up 53 per cent during their term in government. Their policies have been proven to fail. Uh, and that, is why, that is why you have this existential crisis within the Labor Party, where you get the, the wiser heads like Joel Fitzgibbon saying to the Labor Party, you need to remember who you are. We need to actually put the Labor back into the Labor Party. Our childcare package supports low-income earners, middle-income earners. It supports families who are doing it toughest uh, and it supports them in making the choices that they want to make to get on and look after their Thank families. Thank you, Senator Selger. Senator Kitchen. Thank you, Deputy President. In the other place, the Prime Minister uh, rose in the last hour and said, our plan is to get workers who are not in jobs back in jobs. But there was no detail, Madam Deputy President, no detail whatsoever. But what I would say is it is the Labor Party who has actually thought through on how to get people into jobs. And one of those instances is, to, is our proper plan for childcare, of the proper place for female workforce participation and, in turn, a proper plan for the economy. The government has shown a great unwillingness to support working Australian families by providing a fair and properly funded childcare scheme. The coronavirus pandemic and the economic destruction it has wrought has left us with a once-in-a-generation chance to build the economy we want, the economies that Australians deserve. Policymakers learnt this lesson during the Great Depression. You do not cut spending during a crisis. Now is the time for a bold plan to restructure the economy. Yet what do we hear from the, this current government? Nothing like that whatsoever. It is all announcement. Yet the Morrison government would also rather withdraw support early for struggling Australians. They would rather ascribe debt unlawfully to Australians under the robo-debt scheme, not put money into brave policies and nation-building legacy projects. And fixing the unfair childcare system in this country would be just that. Australians pay some of the highest childcare costs in the world. Fees have increased 35 per cent under the Liberals. This is simply not sustainable. It is only under a Labor government that this will be remedied. Our plan, which the Morrison government refuses to support, will scrap the $10,560,000 childcare child care subsidy cap. This cap often sees women losing money just because they undertake an extra day of work. This is just not acceptable. Don't those opposite want to reward ambition, hard work and aspiration? That's what they say, but again, it's all just words. Labor will lift the maximum childcare subsidy rate to 90 per cent. Our plan will not only help more women get back into the workforce, it will also help families with the increased cost in living that the Morrison government has overseen in the term of this government. It will provide for better early childhood learning opportunities. The way the Morrison government has designed their system is that women actually lose money should they wish to return to the workforce and work more than three days a week. The current system locks out more than 100,000 families who simply can't afford it. Our plan is good for the economy, and if the Morrison government is serious about being good economic managers, as they so often say that they are, they would support it. Our plan will lift both workforce participation and spur economic growth. Both KPMG and the Grattan Institute have modelled the economic benefits of increased investment in childcare. In childcare. 
KPMG noted that further investment in this sector could create up to 210,000 more working days a week. This is the equivalent of 30,000 to 40,000 full-time jobs. Now, if those opposite don't like KPMG, the Grattan Institute found that women would increase their hours by up to 13 per cent if the childcare system was reformed to make it cheaper. But as we know, the Morrison government is squibbling their response to the coronavirus-induced economic crisis. It isn't building a plan to create jobs. It isn't investing in critical infrastructure. It isn't easing the burden on families that this awful year has inflicted. Rather than put in place a proper plan for childcare in this country, the Morrison government, and particularly the bungling former flatmate, the Minister for Government Services, would rather hound people with robo-debt notices, all while they knew that this was unlawful. This is perhaps the cruel, most cruel act committed by an Australian government against its citizens that has ever been seen. The economy was already in trouble before last summer's bushfires and coronavirus because of seven going on eight years of inaction by the Abbott Turnbull Morrison government. Government debt will soon reach $1 trillion. The Morrison government has been re relying on outside forces to keep the economy ticking over at every turn unwilling to intervene in order to protect the livelihoods of working Australians. Many Australians haven't had a pay rise in real terms for years. Business investment has been weak for years. But now, when faced with the opportunity to support a policy that would not only alleviate the financial stress felt by working mothers and families— Thank you, Senator Kitching. Your time Thank you. has expired. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, Senator Kitching, you're a good person and you're an honest person, and because you've got an honest face, it means I look at you across the chamber as you say what you do, and I know that not even you believe the bull that you've just been sharing with us, because you know as well as I do that pre-COVID we came into this position with record workforce participation for women. At 61.2 per cent, women were participating in the workforce more than they ever have. And you know, as well as I do, that despite the fact that those opposite love to pretend that they are the party of working people, that they are the party of women, the cost of childcare, childcare fees, went up by 53 per cent in the last term of Labor being in government. So we're not going to stand here and be lectured to by those opposite about how they're the party of affordable childcare. In fact, the very, the very fact that senators stand up in this chamber and pretend that childcare is a women-only issue is itself disturbing, because on this side we know that caring for children is a responsibility that belongs to both parents. It's not something that lies simply on women. It belongs to the entire family. But you'd never know that from what's said by those opposite. You'd think that it only matters to a woman whether or not children are cared for. You know what? We operate in the real world, a real world where blokes like Senator Seselja, like my husband, like many thousands and millions of men across this country are equally invested in Slade too. Slade is a fabulous father who cares just as much for the caring of his children as the many other men in families. I can't speak for you, Mr Watt. Senator Watt, <laughs> you can speak for the legalisation of dope, but you can't speak on this issue. Because in your party, childcare is treated like something that only women can talk about. Here we know it's a whole family issue. That's why those opposite will only ever talk about childcare in the sense of institutional care in a childcare centre. You'll never hear them talking about income splitting and how that might help the whole family. You never hear them talk about the possibility of tax deductibility of in-home care. You'll never hear them talking about sharing the burden of um, raising children across the whole family with income splitting. No, no. It's all about the institutional solution. It's a closed-minded approach. It denies the reality of how many people choose to live their lives, and it denies the fact that there is an uncomfortable truth in Labor's childcare policy, a very, very uncomfortable truth. And that is that Labor's childcare policy 
is one that would tax middle-income families to subsidise the childcare of the very, very wealthy. And if you don't believe me, let me give you this maths. A family in Townsville earning $80,000 a year as a family under Anthony Albanese, Mr Albanese's and, and those opposites policy, Labor's signature position from their budget reply, that family would be subsidising the Sydney family earning $360,000 a year. They would subsidise those on $360,000 a year with the money of the Townsville family earning 80 k Now, where I'm from, that doesn't make much sense. And to make it even worse, they want to bake in permanent spending of $6 billion over four years with no plan to pay it, as well as baking in a subsidy for childcare workers to the tune of $10 billion a decade, again with no plan to pay it. And so we won't take lectures from those opposite. We know the care of children is a whole of family issue. We are prepared to approach it that way. We've put record funding into childcare, $9.2 billion, growing to over $10 billion in the coming years. We've put forward the very first women's economic security statement, and we've renewed it. And we came into this COVID crisis with record women's workforce participation. That is an approach to women's working success and the success of the caring for children in families that we can be proud of and that should be an embarrassment to those opposite as they plan to take from middle income earners to subsidise those on the Sydney Harbour side. Well, good luck to them. We know which Australians we're fighting for. Thank you, Senator Stoker. Senator Walsh. Pity President, well, when asked about the government's plans for making childcare affordable, Senator Birmingham told us, and I quote, the government takes childcare seriously. Well, it's difficult to take this government seriously when it comes to early childhood education. And it's difficult to take this government seriously when it comes to anything that affects working women. Uh, and it's difficult to take this government seriously when it comes to addressing household budgets uh, and real household struggles, because working families with children in childcare today, they are struggling right now. And this government has delivered them no relief. In fact, under this government, childcare fees have increased by more than 35 per cent. More than 35 per cent. And that's happened at exactly the same time as wages have flatlined under this government, with wage growth at record historical low levels under this seven-year Morrison government. And families well, they can do the maths. They know exactly just how expensive and difficult the childcare system is to navigate under this government. They know that many parents actually lose money if they choose to work an extra day or work more than three days a week. And that's why Labor will reduce the cost of childcare. And it's why the Morrison government should commit to our plan, our proposal, to do exactly that, because we will scrap the cap. We will scrap the cap, which often sees parents losing money from an extra day's work. We will keep working to fix Australia's broken childcare system, and we will take the pressure off family budgets with this reform. We will give families the support that they need to succeed in their lives and in their household budgets, support that this government just refuses to deliver. And cheaper childcare, we know, is not just good for families and for household budgets. It's good for the economy as well. It's good for the recovery. And failing to reform childcare, well, that is just another failure of the Morrison government to get our economy moving. We know making childcare more affordable. We know it will lift workforce participation. We know that that, in turn, will increase growth. And cheaper childcare, we know, on the Labor side, is fundamental reform. It's fundamental reform that will absolutely supercharge our recovery. But this government, well, it has repeatedly lacked the vision and the heart to power this recovery for all Australians. This government has repeatedly lacked the vision and the heart to power this recovery for Australian women in particular. First of all, they left too many women out 
of the JobKeeper program. Women who were in fact the hardest hit by this COVID crisis got the least support from the Morrison government. Casuals, hospitality workers, the arts and events sector, university workers. Then, after leaving all of those women workers behind, they removed JobKeeper early for early childhood educators. This government chose to target early childhood educators in this pandemic, the very people who were going to work every day educating our children while everybody else was being asked to stay home to stay safe, a sector that is 95 per cent women. And now they're leaving women out of the recovery. Women have lost more jobs than men in this crisis. There are more women unemployed in Australia than ever before. But the government took no steps to get women back to work in its budget. As we know, they spent one third of one per cent on women's economic security in their budget. They delivered nothing for jobs in sectors dominated by women workers. Nothing for aged care jobs, nothing for early childhood education, the arts, hospitality, higher education. Sectors dominated by women got either nothing, next to nothing, or indeed funding cuts from this government, because women's jobs just do not matter to this government. And when called out on this, we got the government's now famous response that what you can find in the budget for women is our package on road infrastructure, because women drive on roads. That's what women get in this budget, roads. The government just fails to understand that supporting jobs in sectors women work in supports not just 50 per cent of our population, it supports the economy you, as a Walsh. whole. Your time has expired. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator McAllister to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you, De Deputy um, President. I rise to take note of Minister Cash's response, representing, I should say, representing the Minister for Health's response to my question about climate change and a health emergency. And quite plainly, the government doesn't think that climate climate change presents a health emergency. She refused to answer that question, articulated a few of the initiatives the government's taking, but it's curious that one of those did not include ensuring that, in fact, climate change was part of our long-term health plan, national priority health plan. Was, is it in that? No, it's not. So clearly it's not a priority for this government in terms of well, it's, let's face it, climate change is not a priority for this government, but it's certainly not a priority in terms of looking at its, its, the impact it is having on people's health in this country, but also what sort of systems response we need to properly address the impact of uh, climate change on our health system and on people's health. Let's be clear. Climate change is a health emergency. It requires urgent action by government. Literally, people's lives are at stake. If we do not address climate change as a health emergency, people's lives will be lost. We know that. Climate change is already having an impact on people's health and people's lives. As I articulated when I asked the question, 450 people last year have been died or had their lives affected by, uh, through direct, in, direct impact or through air pollution. And, and thousands of others have had their, their lives impacted uh, through the pollution and the damage caused by climate change already. I'd like to point out that, that First Nations peoples will be particularly affected as climate change is, is in the um, health emergency. Yeah. They already have poorer outcomes in their, uh, health, in their uh, health. We already know the gap in life expectancy isn't being closed. We know that First Nations peoples are living in overcrowded housing. Um, we already know that they do, they have, uh, many have less funding available and less resources available in order to respond to the climate emergency as it affects their health. Many live in rural and remote areas and, in fact, are already feeling the impacts of climate change on their health and are already being required, for example, to move in response to it. Just recently, we've had three important reports that have been uh, released that are addressing these issues. Just today, we had the, climate, the Grattan um, Climate Change and Health preparing for the next disaster report, 
where they make seven recommendations and clearly point out that we can't regard the issue of climate change in terms of health as an optional extra. It has to be core business. Yet we know it's not included in the National Preventative Health Strategy, for example. You would have thought it was one of those key areas that government would have thought should have been there. Um, it's not included in the long-term national um, health plan. And research is not being funded at a high enough level. And then we've got the Medical Journal Australia and Lancet Countdown 2020 special report on health and climate change, the lessons learned from Australia's Black Summer. This report um, looks at the health of the Australian public and, and, and sees it as uniquely at risk from the effects of climate change. And it demonstrates the need for the federal government to adopt a national strategy in climate change, health and wellbeing. The report is clearly a, a call to action and also articulates the fact that many of our health experts are saying climate change is a health emergency. And then we have the Centre for Future Work report on climate change producing dangerous heat stress in workplaces. And this report articulates the impacts on, of climate change on people's health in the workplace. It says heat stress poses serious health and safety risks for many workers across Australia, and Australia must act on the causes of rising temperatures and changing weather patterns. So here we have, just recently, really clear evidence that the climate crisis is a health emergency. The government, once again, is missing in action when it comes to addressing climate change. And, and of course, they're refusing to accelerate our, our move to net zero emissions. Quite clearly, we need this government to commit to zero net zero emissions by at least 2035. At least 2035. We are failing to, to take this issue seriously, and it Thank will directly you, lead Seawitt. to lives Your lost. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Seawitt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.